Merhaba, <coughs> günaydın herkese. Um, sorry, yeah, let's uh, speak in English. Um, so, uh, good morning everyone. It's a great honor and pleasure to receive this prize. And uh, I'd like to talk about uh, some of our activities, not all of our projects, of course, uh, but I'd like to talk about our tiny robots that can be used in medical applications. So, I'd like to walk around, if that's okay. Um, so, as uh, uh, Professor Imran Inan mentioned, uh, I'm a director in Max Planck uh, in a new institute of intelligence systems, and I keep in touch with Carnegie Mellon, and I'm now part-time here. So, uh, in my research, <coughs> my inspiration is from nature in many respects at a small scale. Uh, when you look at uh, very small single cells, like amoeba in this case, which can uh, sense a plant cell, act by locomoting using its biomotors, and eventually catching this uh, plant cell is an amazing intelligent behavior, an adaptive behavior that is achieved at a micron scale. And if you go bigger, insect scale, they have more complex neural, uh, also computational intelligence. They can coordinate their activities to achieve tasks that are not possible to do with one single tiny insect. So in that sense, collective behavior at the small scale is also a very exciting uh, area of research. So, <clears throat> and Coming to my research questions in my group, the first main question is how to look at these systems, biological systems, and try to design and build very tiny robots. So there are a lot of principles, physical principles we need to have uh, to achieve such robots, and, and we have a lot of unknowns about their powering, their actuation, sensing, and control. Uh, and the second thing is how can we improve uh, human life using these tiny systems, and in that respect, I'll show you today mainly our activities about medical applications, which I believe, uh, as uh, Professor Idan mentioned, tiny robots could be used in also dangerous ways, but uh, personally, I only like the ways that we can especially make them uh, uh, very useful for patients and human beings uh, in the near term. So if you look at medical robotic systems uh, at the moment, there are a lot of great success stories. As you might know, for example, Intuitive Surgical is a well-known big company right now. They're worth $30 billion or more. Uh, they developed this Da Vinci system, which is a robotic arm system, which can do laparoscopic surgery, which can enter from some small holes and do very minimally invasive uh, surgeries in prostate cancer, especially it's kind of right now becoming a golden standard. And then you can see some needle insertion robots, uh, radioactive x-ray surgery systems, and also some bone milling systems. When you know that the typically doctors use the nail and hammer to drill a, a hole in your bone, which was scary, it's better to do it with robots very precisely. Uh, and also some active catheter research, so you can see some products coming up. But if you look at these devices, they are all connected, tethered, what we call, they are big. So the current trends which we like to bring to medical devices is first, we like to take away the tether and make the device untethered, means put it inside the body with no connection to outside in the sense of wire or any, any cable. So we want to do everything <coughs> remotely. And we like to take, take the scale because all of the devices you, uh, you see in the previous picture, they are typically centimeter or millimeter scale. We like to build devices even smaller than millimeter scale. And typically they are all rigid or becoming slowly flexible but we like to show even some of these devices need to be soft for safety reasons uh, and also will create many interesting behavior that is not possible to achieve with traditional rigid mechanisms. Uh, another big difference is uh, typical operations done with any robots or even normal surgery. You do an operation, that's done. If you're lucky, you save the person. But if this, uh, the same problem repeats, you need to do the surgery again and again. So what we like to do is can we put our devices inside the body, do the operation, but if it's needed, we will keep it there. And if you need it in the future, you will redo the operation without opening the person or doing any surgical operation. So in that sense, when you look at these tiny untethered devices, what you can do in practice, uh, there are many uh, minimally invasive and even unprecedented applications that are not possible at the moment with any medical device. Some of these are with tiny robots we can go and do targeted drug delivery in the right location with their high dose of drug, with minimizing side effects, we like to give uh, drugs in the body. You can do hyperthermia, cancer treatment, again going to the right location, you can heat the robot that can kill the cancer cells. 
you can open or close some vessels uh, uh, on purpose. So in this case, you can close for aneurysmas. In this case, you can open some plugs or you can open some blood clots, and you can do biopsy and many different uh, uh, functions with these tiny devices that we like to achieve. So as an example, the first one I'd like to talk about a pill size of a global device that we have been working on for some time. So in need, uh, you can already see even in Coach Hospital that um, pill camera technology commercialized in 2001 are uh, already widely being used and FDA approved that you can swallow as a patient, go to home and have a recording device that will wirelessly communicate and get images of your GI tract and uh, you don't need any endoscopy that we have typically. And most importantly, these capsules can image your small intestines. Current endoscopes can only go into your stomach or your colon, but they cannot see your small intestine without, or without pulling it, kind of very invasive imaging techniques because we have five meter long small intestine that there is no way to get in except surgery right now. So with these capsule devices, we could enter to these kind of very hard to reach areas, but their problem has been they are only a camera that takes images. So what we like to do is, uh, as compared to our golden standard endoscopy where you can put a tethered device, you can have an active camera imaging, you can give drugs, you can do biopsy, you can do surgery, we like to achieve those functions now with these pill-sized swallowable devices. So that's our uh, main mission. And uh, this is the, uh, one of the latest designs we have, which is uh, a soft design, very safe to use in the body. It has a camera with wireless communication. It has special magnets that we design and put inside with this mechanism where uh, we can remotely use an external magnet from outside that the capsule can be rotated uh, and rolled on the surface so you can actively see with no cable. Basically, you can do this yourself by swallowing and doing it. It's very safe and very easy to do. Of course, this is the easiest function to just visualize. But of course, we like to also achieve other functions like drug delivery. So in this case, in the middle chamber, uh, we put some drugs and then we compress the robot because it's soft with magnetic forces by controlling the magnetic field from outside. We can basically pull the magnets uh, and then we can basically eject the drug in a controlled way. So that means the robot can, capsule can carry drugs and deliver in the right location, in the right amount, in a controlled way. Um, sorry, it's going too fast. Um, so when you do these operations, a uh, very important thing is you need to know where your capsules, because of course you see videos with a camera image, but in reality they are in your stomach. So first you need to detect where they are, and second is you need to actuate from outside using actual magnets or a permanent magnet. So for doing that, we have developed many techniques. So we use whole effect sensor arrays, so eight by eight array here, for example, which can detect the magnetic field change due to your capsule moving inside your body. And that can give three position and two orientation information with the right algorithms. And, uh, and the big challenge here is uh, we can uh, subtract the effect of electromagnets because don't forget, you are creating field to control the capsule and you wanna use field to detect your capsule. So there are a lot of interesting couplings that we have developed the right calibration techniques to decouple the actuation from uh, detection of the capsule, which is patented. So here, the latest uh, function we put in the middle channel now, we put a needle. So in, in some of the biopsies, especially if you have a tumor be, uh, below your skin or tissue, so the only way they can get a biopsy is they use a needle, and many times they insert the needle uh, four or five times, and then they collect the submucosal uh, tissue that way. So to achieve such kind of needle biopsy, we put our needle, which is typically protected inside if the capsule is not collapsing. Um, but when we, let's see, when we basically, uh, this, this is the full system, as I mentioned. So this is eight by eight array of whole effect sensors. These are very custom. So we build everything in our lab. So my students go and build these coils, uh, design all the sensors. We build the whole hardware and software to develop, develop these kind of medical device systems. And then the capsule also is, of course, fabricated with special techniques and with the cameras that are commercially available these days. So if you do the right things now, use, this is just a demonstration to show you that after multiple times of at least five times of uh, contractions, which are controlled with all magnetic forces precisely, then you can collect samples and 
uh, if you try the 10 times the same operation, you can get every time a tissue sample, which is very crucial for diagnosis of the disease. So these are great things because this is a device with no tether. One of the things we sometimes need to tether to get it out. Uh, if it gets biopsy in this case, you don't want it to get dirty. In this case, we have a small string that we pull it out after the operation is done. So this is an example to give you an idea of all issues of how to image, how to track this kind of device, how to actuate it, and what kind of functions you can achieve. But as I mentioned at the beginning, our goal is to really go smaller than this pill size, which is swallowable. Uh, we want to go micro scale uh, devices. And the biggest scientific challenge on making these smaller devices is how to power them, how to actuate them. Because sensors these days can get smaller and smaller, but actuation and power are the hardest ones to put on the capsule. So when you put any of the uh, power on the capsule, it will only work for hours and then it's over. And if you add actuation, it will eat the power in minutes. So that's why we need to develop new techniques. And uh, I just published uh, my textbook on mobile microbiotics after teaching in more than 10 years, where I discuss how to design new actuation, powering, and sensing techniques for these tiny devices, which was published last year. Uh, so let me tell you what we can do to make really submillimeter scale devices. The first approach, which is like the previous capsule, is self-propelled micro robot. So in this case, there are two ways. Uh, first way is if you design a robot, which interacts with the fluid environment that it is inside, or this is air-water interface, it can create some interactions which or light interaction from the environment that will power or actuate the device. So this is the physical synthetic way to do uh, environmental cell propulsion. And the second is using biological cells as your actuators and sensors, which is a very high uh, impact scientific area these days. So let me show you some examples of these devices. So the first one we designed and built, so Hakan is here. Um, so we can, these days, this is amazing about the technology progress. So this is a 3D nanoprinter using two photonography. We can print in 3D any CAD design with 100 nanometer resolution. So we, we have the nice, great, uh, great gift, uh, 3D printed, which is centimeter scale. But now we can do nanoscale, basically, or 100 nanometer scale resolution printers that can print you polymeric, uh, photocurable, structures in 3D in a very precise way. So then, uh, the, uh, of course, the challenge is, okay, you can print polymer materials in 3D, but what functions they can have, or how can you put inside some specific chemistry? So here we developed a new technique uh, last year where uh, we can have multi-step 3D printing, where we do the first printing and second printing. We only functionalize inside area with special chemistry, uh, where we can uh, basically put some platinum nanoparticles. So as you see here, what we do is we put platinum nanoparticles only inside, and when it interacts with the fluid, which is a hydrogen peroxide, that catalytic interaction creates uh, oxygen or hydrogen bubbles, that creates a bubble propulsion. So this is a real propelled robot uh, using the chemistry or catalytic interaction with the fluid. The only problem in this robot, the hydrogen peroxide is toxic, so it cannot be used for medical application. So then we developed this optically uh, actuated new micro robots or swimmers. So in this case, uh, this is material science basically, one micron particles with uh, nanoporous titanium oxide, and we put a gold cap, only half area. They are called Janus particles. So they do self electrophoresis. That means when you put in a water and shine UV light, that creates a catalytic interaction now, not, the, not other chemical catalytic interaction which induces charges on the surface, which is unbalanced, and that charge unbalance creates a momentum transfer so that the particles propel physically because of light energy, okay? So this is really great, so you can see on-off control by light, and then even here you saw that uh, it can be magnetically steered so that we can make these swimmers inside your body because this can work in water, so it doesn't need any special chemistry uh, in this case. So these are new exciting developments, but the only problem is also here, getting light to your body is difficult. It only works in some of the outside areas of your body, but if you go deep inside the body, light unfortunately cannot penetrate. Even near infrared li light these days can only penetrate a millimeter scale. So uh, another uh, physical interaction based propulsion is Marangoni swimmers. So this is a very new work that is not published. We go and my son is from Spain, he's from Barcelona. He goes fishing, he gets some jellyfishes, squids, 
and these squids have these teeth, and these teeth has a special protein that's very strong, very biocompatible, and very durable, and also has a lot of interesting chemistry. So we take this protein, basically, biological protein, and we mix it with some fuel, in this case, some chemical. And if you put on a water-air interface, the uh, basically what happens is this HFIP by time diffuses in a controlled way to the water, and that creates a surfactant gradient that creates Marangoni propulsion, which is surface tension gradient. So this is all like a very nice, cute example, which can be very small scale, very fast. These are all real-time videos. And, and everything is fully a mass-produced, fabricated system. The only thing is you need some air-water interface that works only in some, some application. So these are examples of synthetic robots that we can use physical, chemical, optical interactions with environment. But uh, let me talk about the second approach, which is more, more of our focus these days, is how to use microorganisms as our uh, robotic actuators and sensors. As you know, bacteria and many other organisms live inside our body, and even there's a Nobel laureate uh, in Yale that uh, he showed that bacteria can be used for cancer therapy. Um, so because bacteria can detect oxygen gradients and they can go to the cancer area where there's oxygen consumption very high, and then they can accumulate there like this, and then they first kill the cancer cells because of competition, and second is also they attract all immune cells there, and immune cells who will kill the cancer cells also. So what we do, try to do here is differently is, rather than getting only bacteria to the uh, source of cancer, but we also want the bacteria to carry some cargo, which includes some drugs and other special genes or other cargo that will make the cancer therapy much more efficient than just attracting the immune cells. So in that regard, we look at uh, E. coli bacterium. Uh, as you might have seen them, they are stochastically swimming uh, amazing uh, organisms at a few micron scale. They are very well understood. You can basically engineer E. coli as you like. So if you go to, say, an energetic engineer, you want a special sensing function or actuation function, they can do a lot of engineering uh, with the E. coli. Uh, they are sensing chemical gradients in the environment, gas, oxygen gradients, pH, temperature. They are amazing sensors inside, uh, inside fluidic environments. And in our body, as you might know, in our GI tract right now, I have 1.2 kilogram bacterium, and all of you. So they are in your uh, digestive system. They help you to digest. So if you have problem with your microbiota, you will get diseases. So that's why the bacteria in our body are very well balanced with a lot of interesting mechanisms, symbiotic mechanisms, and we can use those bacteria for your, uh, basically, robotic devices. As I mentioned, they are already used in cancer therapy. So then, uh, as I mentioned, our novelty here is how now we can attach these bacteria to specific uh, materials, like we can in this call case uh, microparticle, which is a poly polymer and in the core, and there's a special process that you can put uh, using, uh, again, chemistry, electrolytic chemistry. You can put uh, polymer nanolayers one by one in a controlled way. And during that process, you can embed many nanoparticles inside the particle. These are all fabricated. And the nice thing after you make this particle, you can open the pores and put chemo uh, chemotherapy drug, which is doxorubicin. It's a well-known chemo chemotherapy drug. So basically, you can make this particle, which has magnetic properties, which has drugs inside, and you can put even genes later, maybe if you want. So you can basically make your own cargo design. Uh, the challenge is how to get, fabricate this thing and then attach to the cell membrane. And there we use some special surface chemistry. In this case, it is just charge at the outside, particles positively charged, bacteria are negatively charged, so they electrostatically stick themselves. So then the idea is we want to drive swarm of these uh, particle uh, particles propelled with bacteria controlled with remote fields, and then we get close to the target of the cancer, we turn off the fields, then bacteria sense the cancer, because as I said, they detect the cancer uh, oxygen gradient, and they go and accumulate there, and then, and then we'll uh, trigger the drugs. So uh, this is the first uh, in vitro study. Here you see that we also show not only oxygen grade, but chemotactic response. This is a quantitative experiment. We create a chemical gradient using some microfluidics, and you see that stochastically, bacteria swim biased way to the source of the attractants of the chemical, um, and then they can be steered remotely with the magnetic field. So 
So after having these properties, uh, we did uh, an in vitro study where we grew uh, breast cancer cells in a petri dish. And uh, the best way you could give doxorubicin cancer drug uh, to these cells by injecting them, injecting the drug directly to the cells. Of course, if you can inject any cancer drug to the cancer tissue directly, this will be the best of the uh, best technique you can ever have. Then you can basically almost kill all the cancer cells. But if you look at this current state of the art uh, cancer therapy drugs, they have the uh, particles with the uh, cancer drug inside. And when you get these drugs, 95% of them don't ever go to the cancer region anyway. So only 5% goes there. And when those 5% goes there, uh, they will diffuse slowly because they are not active particles. They are just basically diffusing as a Brownian motion. Uh, they will, of course, diffuse to these uh, cells, but it will be very inefficient compared to the, the best case. And the nice thing is the same particle now, if we attach to our bacteria, their motility and diffusion constant goes up three, four minutes order higher. And you see that now the efficiency of delivery by time gets close to, uh, I mean, with compared to the current technology, of course, much, much better efficiency to deliver the drugs to the cancer region. So this is promising a good first result. Of course, this is only in vitro. Now we need to do the same experiments in live animals to see how such del delivery really works. The second uh, idea, rather than using synthetic particles, uh, we are now using red blood cells. So because the important thing is our body will react to uh, these, any of these devices inside your body. And the best way to not react is, you know, even in organ transplantation, when they put a new organ to your body, if your immune system don't like that organ, you are dead. So the only way that you can make that organ likable with your body is to use your cells in your own personal body. So personalized medicine. So that's why personalized medicine can be done in this case. We can take the patient's uh, very small blood sample. We can collect millions of red blood cells from that blood sample. And then we functionalize these red blood cells, I'll show you. Uh, we put inside the cancer drug and nanoparticles, which are magnetic, and stick our bacteria to this kind of red blood cell using, in this case, biotin streptin or avidin type of special chemical bonding. But to do that, we use a genetically engineered E. coli that we collaborate with a, a microbiologist in Max Planck in Magdeburg, where they can basically have a biotin uh, expressing E. coli where uh, we can directly attach the biotin side of the bacteria membrane to our uh, red blood cells where we put some avidin type of chemical coating. <clears throat> so let me show you how this works. So we first take your, again, red blood cell. We first take out the hemoglobin, so they can make ghost red blood cells uh, with some process. And then it's in empty inside. So now you can put inside by doing hypotonic treatment, the pores of the red blood cell opens, and now you can put drugs and nanoparticles inside. And when you put the isotonic treatment, red blood cell now has all the cargo that you like to carry. And with the surface treatment, then you can attach the bacteria. And there is many nanoparticles. You see that if you put a magnet, these red blood cells now will go and stick to the uh, magnetic area. So then, as you see, this red blood cell stuck with the bacteria is propelled by the bacteria uh, in a fluidic me medium, which is a biological medium. In this case, not steered, but in the second case, um, sorry, this pointer. In the second case, now, you use remote magnetic fields. You see the field direction. So then the swimmer follows exactly the path of the remote field. So that means we can target the swimmer into the right region that we want to deliver our drugs uh, in a precise and controlled way. Uh, and also we can take advantage of the bacteria sensing later. So the nice thing about red blood cell with the bacteria is if there is a very small gap, which is two micro in this case, that the, this kind of red blood cell can be squeezed in because of its soft material properties. As you know, uh, red blood cells are very flexible, elastic materials. That's why they don't get stuck in your capillaries. Otherwise, we will be all dead. So the, by evolution, red blood cell has the very elastic uh, properties. They can deform drastically to pass through very, very small gaps, like in this case. Uh, and the lastly, uh, after delivering the drug, uh, we like to also try to do uh, some hyperthermia where, in this case, we like to use near infrared light uh, to basically apply local temperature to kill the cancer cells besides the cancer drug. 
So in this case, we put inside, uh, also as I said, we can put almost anything inside red blood cell. In this case, we put an ICG type of special chemical um, agent that we can use light to heat it up. So this chemical absorbs the infrared light and creates temperature locally uh, up to 45 degrees is good enough for killing cells. And you see that we can kill the cells as one good news thing, which is the cancer cells. The second good news is you all at the same time kill the attached bacteria so that there is no bacteria left in your body after the operation is over. And the red blood cell degrades completely because it's a biomaterial of your body so that you don't have anything left over that will cause any toxic effect in your, blood, in your body in the, after the operation. So uh, to wrap up this part, uh, basically nowadays we can even use algae, which is a very new work, just recently published. Because bacteria are great, but our immune cells hate bacteria. If you get them in your blood, you will create sepsis or many side effects. That's why algae is an interesting organism where we can also attach our particles of red blood cells. And then uh, they're very fast, also much faster than bacteria, three times faster. And they're more friendly to our body and they can be imaged, uh, they are really fast. So this is, uh, this is another promising organism that we will use for medical applications in the, in the near future. Okay, so the, the last part I'd like to talk about, a second approach of creating very tiny devices is rather than propelling on board, which is self-propulsion, why don't we use external fields to propel devices? So this could be external magnetic fields or gradients, this could be electrical fields, this could be light again, and it could be also acoustic waves. So these are all coming outside of your body, which are all used in ac acoustic imaging, magnetic like MRI imaging. So these are things which are already used in your body in different ways. <clears throat> so uh, we choose magnetics typically because uh, they are very robust and long range uh, fields. Our body is full transparent to magnetic fields. So in that sense, we have these days uh, clinical MRIs with uh, even seven Tesla that you can get very high resolution images. <clears throat> and there is no side effects, uh, only <clears throat> gradients of the magnetic field you need to be careful because our neurons can be activated at some gradient or time change of the field, then you can get some pain, but we have always FDA limits of these fields that we always make sure that we never go beyond. Uh, so when you use fields, or magnetic fields, so there are two ways you can use them for actuation. One is you can use the fields and the magnetic forces of the robot, and the cross product will give you a torque. So like a compass, if you have a magnetic property, you will always align with the fields. That's the torque of the uh, magnetic field. The second is you can create special gradient like a magnet creates a non-uniform non field. That will create a special gradient that will pull the robot towards the magnet. So these are two ways of pulling versus rotating with magnetic fields are very efficient ways at the small scale for actuation. So this is an example. We have an ultrasound imaging device and we have these magnets that you can spin and now you can turn this millimetric uh, spiral shaped robot. So you see it's uh, 500 micron diameter and millimeter scale long, and this is a blood clog in your artery. So we can spin this robot using these magnetic remote uh, rotating field magnets in 30 hertz. So that means in, every, in one second, it spins 30 seconds. That's why you cannot see it clearly. And you will see that by time, it will mechanically unclog the blood clot, which is very dangerous for stroke and other uh, reasons, and then uh, we can get them out uh, for saving some of the patients. So this is one of the functions you can see as an example. Uh, another example is going much smaller, again, very few micron, tens of micron scale. Uh, as I mentioned, 3D nanoprinting is nowadays, we have established as a, a standard technique to make 3D robots, and we can now build them uh, out of, uh, in this case, a gelatin type of biomaterials that are biodegradable. Because one big issue with medical devices, after you put inside your body and after operation is over, you need to take it out or it should degrade by time inside your body. And the best way is of course degradation and this is enzymatically degraded uh, special gelatin material that in your body we have some concentration of these uh, enzymes that will by time after days or weeks will degrade your material, the robot, and after operation is done you don't have to worry about any, any left materials in your body. So, uh, and the last uh, part is, now I showed you these designs which are what we call rigid designs. 
<clears throat> but when you look at some of the animals inside uh, in fluids, like octopi, they are very soft. They can squeeze into a basically bottle. I don't know if you're a diver, you will see that you can get an octopus coming out of from a small hole because they can change their shape, program their shape in a very drastic ways by basically their salt body properties. They can use their salt body as an arm versus swimming arms or even as a leg. So this is an octopus basically walking on the uh, sea floor. And, and if you are soft, like in this movie, also you are very safe for medical applications or any interaction with the human. Softness is really desirable uh, robotic property. So in this direction, uh, we have proposed uh, soft uh, robotic devices at a very small scale. And the main principle we have used is remote magnetic actuation of these uh, elastic salt bodies. So in that sense, uh, the first project we did was published a few years ago. Uh, we took an elastic sheet and we said, like, I want to deform this elastic sheet in any shape you want. That's your desired uh, varying shapes. And we developed a computational technique that will take these desired shapes and will find the magnetic properties of the sheet and the required external fields and gradients that you need to apply to create these old deformations in the same robot. <clears throat> and there's a non-linear optimization technique after you define mathematically everything correctly, and then you can find the desired magnetic properties and required fields to create all of these shapes in the same robot. So let me show you how we used this thing uh, recently in a Nature paper in February, how we, uh, we basically created a new uh, millimeter robot that can change its shape. Like, I don't know, we call it Gumby uh, in, in English, and also we have hop tonton in my kid times. So that can you have a robot that can change its shape to create a lot of different dynamics uh, in very different environments? So, uh, because when you look at salt-bodied organisms at the small scale, like caterpillars, sea elegans, or sperms, and jellyfishes, they can do very diverse uh, salt-bodied locomotion in complex environments. So the question and the challenge is, can you make a single robot that can have all of these modalities together in the same system? And the answer is yes. Uh, here, of course, a lot of uh, theory and knowledge behind created the special magnetic properties of the elastic sheet. In this case, just for proof of concept, mini scale, but we can miniaturize it to micron scale. Um, the important property is you want to make a magnetic profile which is non-uniform, uh, which we do by rolling the elastic sheet with magnetic particles on a road. We magnetize, and when we open, it creates this kind of a wave pattern. And this wave pattern, you can control the phase difference. A lot of details. Uh, we had 90 pages of supporting document about all the modeling and theory behind these robots. Uh, but when you do the right things, uh, sorry, so what happens is the robot body with the applied external fields uh, can change it. If you give, for example, a field, small field, in a specific direction, it can create a sine wave, a cosine wave, or if you apply a bigger field, a, a basically U-shape or V-shape, all created by the salt body interaction with magnetic field. Uh, but also, magnetic field can apply a magnetic torque because when you deform the shape, the magnetic properties don't become any more zero. Then you can also apply torque on the body. So combining all of these uh, shape deformations and the body torques, now we can go and do this uh, basically combined locomotion. You see that the robot can do rolling on the surface, can jump, uh, basically go down to the water surface. And now underneath this body with a traveling wave, this is only thing we control in the system is the external field direction and the magnitude. This is slowed down, so they are really fast. And then you can get this robot uh, underwater by immersing it. So here you need to uh, break the surface tension, which is very strong at the scale. But after you go underwater, you can swim like a jellyfish, or you can sp uh, swim like, also like a, a sperm. So by all controlling the body deformations in a dynamic way. Of course, these are all dynamic time-dependent waveforms that we learn and design uh, how to create so that we can get all these interesting behavior. So, uh, of course, these are again slowed down. And when the robot goes back to the water surface, the nice thing is it can deform its body shape by just curving it, and then it can climb on the water meniscus uh, using this shape change of the body curvature. And eventually, to get on the dry surface, it can break the water contact by rolling by this torque 
and now it can start walking. So this is an uh, interesting gait that some caterpillars use uh, for ground surface locomotion. And the big issue is when you have a three-dimensional obstacle on your way, the robot needs to climb over, or the best way they do at the small scale is jump. So it can jump at a very uh, fast, uh, dynamic way again, because it can use the elastic energy by deformation to create an impulse that will uh, push up the robot and create a jumping behavior. So then it can keep uh, walking. And another uh, trail for the robot testing was what if we want to squeeze it into a small tubes where we have a lot of uh, you know, vessels and tubes inside our body. So then uh, we put a tubular uh, also environment um, across to the robot's walking area. And there, for example, it cannot walk anymore if it tries to walk. Of course, this is a smaller gap that robot cannot squeeze in. But if it changes this uh, dynamic behavior, rather than walking, what we call is crawling, by creating this body undulations as a traveling way, the robot can pass through the gaps and can keep walking. It can go backwards uh, in any direction. <clears throat> so all of these things were achieved with the same robot the first, for the first time. This is indeed a breakthrough in robotics because you cannot see one robot that can achieve jumping, rolling, walking, climbing on water surface, uh, swimming in two different ways, and also crawling inside uh, environments. And when we do these things, the robot speeds are very fast. So in one second, the robot can go 20 centimeters in your body. They can jump very high, and, uh, and we have a lot of theory behind these uh, behaviors, um, but again, no time to talk about. Um, but of course, the demos were in a synthetic environment, just to develop the concept, and now we are applying such robot in a, a really bi a biological medical environment. So in this case, the stomach, as you see, we can have stomach with fluids and also very wet complex tissue with very three-dimensional uh, texture. So the robot can go on the water surface, can go on the tissue. Uh, and the <clears throat> easiest way to crawl, um, go on the tissue surface is rolling dynamics, is very robust. And then the goal was to reach this uh, area for some medical drug delivery. So then to reach there, robot now cannot climb over this obstacle anymore, so it can jump there. But this is, again, an imaging of the visual uh, pr uh, process. Um, of course, in real medical environment, you cannot visually see. So then what they are using now is ultrasound. So this is ultrasound video. So we bought the chicken tissue from the market to just show that we can put our robot inside the chicken tissue, and the robot is now magnetically actuated, and at the same time, ultrasound imaging. And this is slow down, so everything is in real time. So we can basically see the robot in your body with no problem while, <coughs> while we actuate it. So uh, another nice thing about the robot, besides doing all these locomotion types, it can also have functions like, for example, if you want to grab this object, now the robot shape can be controlled to grab the object like a gripper, now hand, it can, it can trans transport it and deliver it. A more advanced version uh, is, sorry, is to make a pocket rather than grabbing only um, so basically, we can put a pocket here, and then inside the pocket, we put drugs, and when the robot comes to the right place, it changes the shape in a drastic way, in the reverse way, and you will see that we can open the pocket and uh, basically projectly, I mean, push and, and, and give the drug into the right location. <clears throat> so these are all achieved by the shape uh, change of the body, and nowadays, uh, these are new works using this kind of salt-bodied robot designs. We are, for example, making new cilia robots, which are creating metachronal waves. As you know, we have a lot of cilia in our body. So in your brain, in a uh, lot of uh, areas, the mucus, mucus materials are moved, or fluid is moved with the cilia. And because of this kind of wave pattern that we can now synthetically generate for some medical <coughs> device applications. So uh, the last uh, new project that is not published is uh, See, jellyfish uh, swimming, we have now went more advanced in the design. So if you look at a real jellyfish, of course, morphologically, it's different. Now we build a jellyfish robot using soft uh, material actuation with magnetic field. And as you can see, it can create almost the same, uh, same swimming behavior. This is a new exciting work that we are working on. So what we have done, we look at biological swimming of the jellyfish undulation of the body when it has power stroke and recovery stroke. 
and we synthetically created it with our magnetic elastic material. But the difference is we also added some elastic other material to create exact um, fluidic behavior with some uh, more complex uh, structure at the end. Now, if you combine all of these things with the magnetic actuation, this is the exact what animal does, which is what we call biomagnetic uh, swimming of the jellyfish robot. And then we can also make uh, different kinematics, like uh, with very small amplitude, with much strong uh, power stroke, and then some longer gliding phases. Now we can make a jellyfish robot that has a lot of different kinematics than <coughs> the animal. So because robotically we can change anything we want. So with these changes, uh, one thing that uh, jellyfishes try to do is they are very important for bio mixing. So that means they can locally mix the fluid by their swimming dynamics. And uh, you will see that in oceans, indeed jellyfishes have a big environmental impact on how they mix all the uh, you know, organisms and the fluids in the ocean. <clears throat> and we can show that robotically. And, and also what we have seen interestingly is with the right body kinematics, we can trap only small or only big objects because don't forget, they need to eat food, and they only achieve with their uh, body motion in a controlled way. And we have now new clues that they can do it in a controlled way. They, if they have a big fish, uh, uh, let's say prey versus a small one, they can change their body undulations to trap the object in a stable way, which is exciting because we can also use it for uh, <clears throat> selectively trapping objects to transport and deliver, again, in medical and other applications. <clears throat> so, uh, basically, uh, to uh, wrap up this uh, last part, um, we are currently trying to develop more specific robots for specific medical applications. <clears throat> I haven't had time, but we work on deep brain stimulation without uh, any cables from outside, so it's wireless uh, deep brain stimulation as one specific application, and we have many other applications. So we have now uh, medical people from Coach University in our group, and also here we are talking together to find out specific disease applications where <clears throat> these tiny devices can be used to save uh, lives of some patients. Uh, to do that, we also add more medical functions. Uh, we are interested in how to uh, basically block specific vessels uh, for embolization. Uh, hyperthermia, as I showed, we want to do more in, a, more in a controlled way and neural stimulation. <clears throat> And the one big issue, as I mentioned, any of these devices getting in your body, whatever design you choose, uh, they need to be immunofriendly, so they cannot be creating any immunotoxic effect. So we are working on those scientific problems. And also, as I mentioned, uh, ideally, we like to degrade these robots inside your body so that you don't need to take them out. <clears throat> and finally, uh, we have just acquired a new MRI system in our lab. Uh, we have already ultrasound and x-ray and also it will have a PET option. So basically you need to use a lot of medical imaging techniques and imaging methods to track these tiny devices. So when you go micron scale, no medical device can see it. So only way to, the, to see it with special materials or we make swarms of these robots. Uh, in that sense, we are right now working on how to see these robots inside your animal body and then achieve the functions that we like to have to show that all of the methods we develop are <clears throat> clinically viable um, in the near future. So all uh, of this work, behind all this work, of course, a um, great uh, team of people, uh, around 20 postdocs and 20 peer students with backgrounds in engineering and many different uh, disciplines of science and also medicine, uh, and a lot of other visitors and students. Um, and uh, I have just checked that 30% of these students are Turkish. Uh, researchers, and um, of course I have a lot of collaborators around the world, and I have many collaborators already in Koch University also, and of course a lot of my lab members are now professors or, or um, senior researchers in the industry, so I have now around uh, 50 peer students, alumni all together, and 50 postdocs, and uh, they're all around the world, <clears throat> and of course we've gotten many funding in the U.S., around 30 million from different agencies, and now Max Planck Society is funding our research. And I hope we will have more collaborations now with Coach University and more interactions in this kind of exciting, challenging uh, research field. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. <clears throat>